So, so far this semester, we've looked at magnets and magnetism, the force exerted between a pair of, of uh, magnetic objects, for instance, the compass needle here and the, uh, you know, the south pole or north pole of, a, of an actual bar magnet like the one shown here. Uh, we've looked at the underlying cause of magnetism, which appears to be the motion of electric charge. So, for instance, in this device, I ran a current through it, maybe about one or two amps from a power supply, and I was able to deflect the compass needle in the same way that this magnet is able to deflect the compass needle by uh, overcoming the Earth's magnetic field and the way that it influences this little handheld magnet here that you can use for navigation. We're going to explore one more phenomenon for this course, and then I'm going to wrap up the subject of magnetism and discuss its context in the larger role of modern physics, especially in our understanding of the phenomenon which we take for granted called light. But before we get to that, I need to demonstrate something called magnetic induction. And it's easiest to just describe that phenomenon by showing you a few demonstrations. So what I have here is just a simple copper wire solenoid. You can see it's just a hollow tube and it's got all of these copper wire windings around it. You see it's empty inside and that's just an insulating material around which the wire has been wrapped. And it has wires at each end where I can connect, uh, for instance, an electric potential difference from some external source or I could hook a voltmeter up to this and look for an electric potential difference to be created. So here I have a trusty voltmeter and right now it's not hooked up to anything so you're just seeing noise in the voltmeter itself. But what I can do is I can take the two leads from the voltmeter and I can connect one of them to one end of the solenoid and I can connect the uh, other wire to the other end of the solenoid. Now right now there are no batteries in this system so effectively I'm measuring the electric potential difference across nothing. I'm, it's a conductor but there's no voltage on it whatsoever. You can see here it just reads zero. Now what I'm going to do is uh, take a, a bar magnet pair and I've got the north ends and the south ends lined up so that they're pointing in the same direction so I've made this magnet nice and strong. So again keep your eye on the voltmeter you'll see it says zero and if I put the bar magnet inside suddenly the readings on the screen change from zero to non-zero numbers and it happens again when I take the bar magnet out. So again focus on the voltmeter I'm going to put the magnet down inside of the solenoid and you see a voltage occurs with a negative sign and then a voltage occurs as I withdraw the magnet from the solenoid as well and again. So what I have just demonstrated to you is an incredible phenomenon known as magnetic induction. And it's basically what you just observed. You have a voltmeter hooked up to this solenoid, this long winding of copper wire that's been coated in an insulator so that the wires themselves don't actually touch each other. We know from the Bios of Art Law that each of these loops is capable of producing a magnetic field if one uh, runs a current through this, but I'm not running a current through this. Rather, I'm taking the bar magnet, just a simple north and south pole archetypal bar magnet, and I am merely inserting it into the tube, and the response is, is something really astounding and that is the induction of a voltage. So let me go ahead and do this. Okay, so if I move this in, we get a voltage of one sign, and if I take it out, we get a voltage of another sign. This is really an incredible phenomenon, and it's one that's been known about since the 1800s. Basically what we're observing is that this is the symmetric partner, the twin, if you will, of the Bios of Art Law. The Bios of Art Law says that moving electric charge creates magnetic field. But this experiment tells us that there's a beautiful flip side to that statement. Moving magnetic field can create moving charge. I'm creating an electric potential difference in this wire with no physical contact between the bar magnet and the wire. I'm just moving in the plane of the solenoid and I can create a voltage down here. It's fleeting. It only occurs while the magnet is in motion, while the magnetic field lines, if you imagine them uh, you know, going into the South Pole or coming out of the North Pole and then being moved down into this, this solenoid, they're penetrating the plane of the solenoid and they are, as a result of this, causing a voltage to occur in the wire.
and as we know, a voltage drives a current. Ohm's law is in effect in this device. It's copper, it's got a low resistivity, but nonetheless it, it has some resistance. And so V equals IR works. And if I induce a V by moving this magnetic field inside and out of the solenoid, if I make a V, there's an R in here, and I'm making an I, I'm making a current in response to that. So it's a beautiful symmetry. Moving electric charge, current, makes magnetic fields. But changing magnetic fields, moving magnetic fields, can also make a current flow, in this case, in a conductor. And so we're going to explore this phenomenon a little bit more with some other demonstrations. But this is the phenomenon simply known as magnetic induction, the ability of a changing magnetic field to induce a voltage and, in a conductor, uh, something with some resistance in it, a corresponding flow of electric charge or current. We can explore this phenomenon of magnetic induction a bit more closely and in a slightly more controlled way using one of these FET demonstrators. So I have here a simple simulated laboratory containing a bar magnet, you know, much like the one that I showed you in the live demonstration video. And I have here a, a simple solenoid. It's just a two loop winding of copper wire and it's attached to a light bulb which is a resistor. Uh, like any resistor if a current flows through it there will be resistance to the flow of current. This will establish an electric potential difference across the resistor and that will allow electric charges for instance to do work. We would expect the light bulb to light if a voltage is present. Well, we can repeat the demonstration that was done in the live video simply by moving the magnet into the coil of wire. So let me go ahead and do that. And we see as I move the magnet through the coil of wire, the light bulb glows briefly. Now interestingly, it glows as the end of the magnet enters, less as the center of the magnet passes through the coil, and then it glows again as the other end of the magnet exits the, the, uh, the loop. So let's actually examine the magnetic field from this magnetic dipole here for just a moment. We observe that at the ends of the magnet, the north end here and the south end here, the magnetic field is changing very rapidly. The magnetic field lines are diverging as you go further from the poles of the magnet, and that means that the field is weakening further from the end of the bar magnet. As we get closer to the end of the bar magnet, the field lines grow in density. They clump together. There are many more of them per unit uh, volume or area near the end of the, the magnet. And then as the end of the magnet passes through, when we look at the center, we see that while there is a changing magnetic field here in terms of the density of lines, the change is not as great as it was at the ends, where these lines diverge very rapidly over a distance of, say, half the length of the bar magnet. But over here, half the length of the bar magnet, the magnetic field line spacing doesn't really change all that much. And then as we get to the south pole, we see the same uh, end of magnet phenomenon again. The magnetic field line density in space changes very rapidly from right here at the end of the magnet to further away from the pole of the magnet. So let's observe this dragging of the bar magnet through the loop one more time and think very carefully about what is changing as we pass the bar magnet through the loop. It was this kind of investigation that a young scientist named Michael Faraday uh, would have been doing to examine the exact cause of magnetic fields inducing currents and voltages in conductors, for instance. So let's do our own investigation. Now watch very closely. I'm going to bring the north pole of the bar magnet into the loop and I'm going to do this at a constant rate, so I'm going to try to drag this magnet at a very constant speed through the loop. Then the middle of the bar magnet will enter. Watch very carefully what happens to the light bulb as the north end passes through and then the middle of the bar magnet traverses the central area of the coil. And then finally watch the light bulb again as the south end of the, of the bar magnet passes through the coil. Watch. What did you observe? Well, if you said that you observed that as the north end of the magnet passed through the coil, the bulb glue, uh, glowed brightly for a second. But then as the middle of the bar magnet passed through, the glowing ceased and almost stopped altogether before the south end of the magnet passed through the area of the coil. And then the glowing started again 
then you made a pretty good observation. Let me do this again, but going from right to left. And again, I'll try to maintain a constant speed for the bar magnet as I go through the coil. South, middle, north. North, middle, south. South, middle, north. But what is it that's actually changing as we move the bar magnet through this loop of wire that's causing a voltage and a current to flow through the resistor, the light bulb? Well, we can bring in a little device to measure magnetic field. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just drag this over here and just kind of show you that as I move this device with the little crosshairs through the magnetic field of the bar magnet, we see that as I bring it closer to the North Pole, that magnetic field gets very strong. And this is merely a reflection of the graphical representation that we as humans use to represent magnetic fields. The magnetic field lines are growing much, much closer together as you approach the poles of the magnet. And so you would expect the strength of the magnetic field to go up because, after all, it's the closeness, the density of those lines that represents the strength of the magnetic field in a picture-like way. If I take the magnet uh, measuring device and I move it closer to the center of the magnet, we see that here the magnetic field is relatively constant in strength. It's about three or so gauss. It's not changing very much over the center of the magnet. Uh, and again, contrast that with moving back here toward the pole, where as I sweep around the end, we see we've gone up a factor of about five in magnetic field strength from uh, you know, t uh, five, three, four, five or so gauss, now almost up to 30. So actually almost a factor of 10 increase in magnetic field. Okay, so let me sweep this back along the middle. We see we've, we hit sort of our minimum strength magnetic field. And then as I bring the, the magnet measuring device uh, around the ends, we get close to where the magnetic field lines are clumping very strongly. Again, on the south end, we get a big magnetic field. So let's put our magnet measuring device right here. And I'm going to move the bar magnet through the coil again. I'm going to try to avoid having the magnet touch the crosshairs, because after all, the field's super strong inside the magnet itself, and that's going to skew the measurement. So let me move the magnet through the loop again, and watch very closely what happens to the B uh, average, the average magnetic field in Gauss. You see right now it's about half a Gauss. And as I come in at my constant rate, you see it goes up. As the poles pass through, and it decreases as we go toward the middle of the bar magnet and it sort of levels out. So let me do this again. See, we're up to about three gauss here and it decreases again a little bit and then it increases to three gauss again as we come through all the way. And go through one more time and try to do a nice constant velocity with this. It's a little hard to do with these little track pads. Michael Faraday uh, realized as he studied this phenomenon that the key thing that's changing is the density, the number of the magnetic field lines penetrating the area of the coil in this case. So we have um, the density of magnetic field lines represented uh, in general, the strength of the magnetic field is represented by B, the magnitude of B vector. So our magnetic field strength in Tesla, or Gauss in this case. The area is some fixed thing for the coil. It's not changing. I mean, we could invent a system where the area changes and the magnet stays in the same place and we would see the same effect, okay? So we have a situation where B is changing through A and uh, B, the vector B, dotted into the vector A is a quantity known as flux. And this is the quantity which Michael Faraday recognized was the key quantity that when changed, whether A is changing or whether B is changing, when flux is changed, when B vector dot A vector is changed, that's when a voltage is created. And in fact, he figured out the relationship between those two things, uh, which we now will explore a bit. It's called Faraday's law. Uh, combined with the uh, Biot-Savart law and Coulomb's law, uh, written in various forms, this is one of the four fundamental laws of electromagnetism. That is the the, the merging of electricity and magnetism. And by exploring the magnetic force, we've seen that electricity and magnetism are deeply connected in some way. Magnetic fields can tell electric charges in motion how to bend their paths. We know that moving electric charge can generate magnetic fields. And we also know that changing magnetic fields now, magnetic induction, can cause charges to move in response and thus set up an electric potential difference and a current flow, for instance, in a conductor.
So what I'd like to do now is explore a little bit Faraday's law of induction. You can largely credit two key researchers with the discovery of magnetic flux and how its changes induce voltages and currents in conductors. Michael Faraday is somebody I've mentioned before. He was an incredible young physicist. He, was, uh, he came from poverty. Uh, most of, at the time it was customary in England that somebody who didn't have personal resources and wealth and connections would have an extremely hard time breaking into the scientific elite of the day. But Faraday managed through the fact that he was just brilliant uh, to, to, to rise up and, uh, and first start working with other well-known scientists, but then establish his own career through his own discoveries. And has, uh, to this day is still one of the finest minds uh, that our species has ever seen. Uh, he's the person who's credited with, uh, with discovering the fact that a changing magnetic field can induce an electric current, uh, an electric potential difference. Uh, but also Joseph Henry, uh, as shown here in 1870, uh, he, the two of these together are, are, uh, can, can share a lot of the credit for coming up with this key idea that changing magnetic flux induces electric current in a conductor. Okay, so this is the principle that we're now exploring in more detail, and we'll use some mathematics to start exploring this in even more detail. So we can explore this idea of magnetic flux mathematically, and the way in which we in the physics community represent this, in which now you will represent it uh, as well, is simply to construct the following dot product of two vectors. So let's imagine we have a loop of wire, and that loop of wire has some radius r. That means it has an area. We can calculate that area. We know that it's just pi r squared. Now if you think back a few lectures, you can remind yourself that any area like this, I mean for instance a, a loop of current carrying wire with some area a, uh, its area can be represented by a vector that is perpendicular to the surface of that area at all locations. So for instance, the easiest thing to do is to say, OK, well, I'm going to just pick the center of the area to be my representative location. And I'm going to draw a vector that's exactly perpendicular, for instance, to the radius that I've drawn here. And I'm going to label that vector a vector. Okay? And that can be written as the area times a unit vector, a hat. And that unit vector points perpendicular to the surface of the loop in this case. Okay, so the nice thing about doing this, uh, in fact, this is a standard trick, for instance, in mathematics and in computer graphics and animation. You represent a, an area using a single vector that's perpendicular to the surface of that, that area. Why? Well, because it's much easier to describe the orientation of a tilting surface using this vector. It's much easier to describe the orientation of the surface as I, for instance, tilt it like this, using a single vector perpendicular to its surface. And that vector will always indicate the orientation of the surface. That way I don't have to worry about how all the things on the surface are pointing. I can just have one vector that sums up the whole thing. So if we imagine that this dry eraser here is an area, and I, and I define a vector perpendicular to it at all points, as I tilt the dry eraser, we see that the vector tilts very nicely in space. And so if we want to know the orientation of the surface at any point, we only need to know the orientation of a single vector perpendicular to its surface. We know everything about where the rest of that flat surface is located in space. So it's very typical to characterize the area with a vector perpendicular to its surface like this. Now the magnitude of that vector is just the area, in the case of a circle, pi r squared. And then, of course, here, you know, we might say, well, uh, as an example, we have an x-axis here, uh, we have some y-axis here, and then this here is a z-axis pointing up out of the plane. So the circle lies in the x-y plane, and then we have a, a z-axis perpendicular to that, and, and in this case, I've just chosen, for convenience sake, that the area uh, vector points uh, along the z-axis. Okay, well, that's all well and good. This lets me characterize an area uh, using a vector. How might we actually use this in practice? Well, imagine, if you will, a solenoid 
much like the one we saw in the FET demonstration with two loops of conductor like this. And these might be hooked up to some resistor up here. And we could pass a bar magnet through this. If that resistor was a light bulb, we could get the light bulb to light. Great. Well, these are loops of wire. And they have some area, A. All right, so for instance, if we knew the radius of this was one centimeter, we could calculate the area using pi r squared. Great. Well, I can characterize the orientation of the areas of these loops because they are parallel to one another with a single vector A vector, which is, uh, has a magnitude of pi r squared and a direction that's perpendicular to the flat surface of the loop. Now imagine, if you will, that I have some magnetic field that I can now have penetrate the area of this loop. So for instance, I, I might imagine that I could set up some external magnetic field B that points uh, parallel to A, or maybe at some angle to A. I now want to characterize this sort of penetration of the magnetic field through the area. And the quantity that we use to do this is known as uh, Greek letter phi, capital phi, with a subscript B. And this is magnetic flux. And this word just means the flow of magnetic field, in this case, through an area. And mathematically, the way that we write this is we just take the dot product of B and A, the area vector, the vector that characterizes the orientation of the area. We can see already what this is going to be. This is just the dot product of two vectors. So it's the magnitude of the resulting product. And that's going to simply be BA cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the magnetic field vector at a given point and the area vector at a given point. Now, in this case, I've chosen it very conveniently. We have a uniform magnetic field. At all points here, the angle between A and B is the same. And in fact, it's 0. And the cosine of 0 is 1. So in this picture, we just have B times A. And that's it. No other modification is required. Now, on the other hand, I could have chosen something a little bit more complicated, right? I could have oriented my surface at some funny angle like this, characterized again by the vector A. And again, I could have had my, my B field pass through this area, still horizontal, my, for instance, along the x-axis. But now we see that there's an angle. There's an angle between the orientation of the plane, the flat surface, the loop, and its vector A, and the magnetic field vector B. And now I have a non-zero angle. So now the flux would be changed. And in fact, we see that the minimum flux that one can obtain is when the magnetic field is completely parallel to the surface of the uh, loop in this case. So if this is my magnetic field vector, this is my surface, there is no penetration of the magnetic field lines through the surface if the magnetic field lines are parallel to that surface at all locations. They never pass through the plane of the surface unless they tilt at a slight angle like this. And so in this case, when you have parallel B to the surface, we now have a situation where A and B are perpendicular. They make a 90 degree angle, of pi over 2 radians. And the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So this has all the properties of what we're looking for, for characterizing the penetration of the surface by magnetic field. When there is no penetration of the surface, that is, the lines never pass at an angle through the surface, this quantity is 0. And when they're perfectly aligned, when the A vector and B vector are perfectly aligned so that all the magnetic field penetrates directly perpendicularly through the surface, then we get the maximum flux that we can ever have. So maximum flux occurs at zero angle between A and B. Minimum flux, zero, occurs when A and B are at a right angle to one another. So we'll explore this quantity a little bit more and look at Faraday's law of induction, which is based on this quantity. Faraday's law of induction is actually quite simple. And I'll just summarize, substitute this briefly as Faraday's law. What it says is, if I have, uh, for instance, some kind of coil of wire, and I change the magnetic flux 
penetrating the areas of these loops. So pick any one of them, okay, so any one of these will have some area A. If I have a magnetic field that starts off weak, but then I increase its strength over time, thus increasing B dot A, more B gives you more B dot A, gives you more phi sub B, more flux. If I change that over time, what will happen in here if I were to pick two points, little a and little b, to put a voltmeter here and measure the electric potential difference, the voltage across these two points, what I would find is that I would get a uh, voltage here, which is non-zero. As the flux changes, the voltage increases from zero to something else. And so Faraday recognized that EMF, electromotive force, which we've written as a sort of calligraphy E in the past, is related to, it's proportional to, okay, so that's what that symbol means, it looks like a little fish or something like that, it's proportional to the change in magnetic flux with time. If magnetic flux changes over some period of time, if B grows stronger, if A gets bigger or smaller, if the angle between B and A changes at all, that any of those things would change magnetic flux. Remembering again that this is B A cosine theta. If any of these things changes, theta, A, or B, any of them changes with time, there will be a voltage that's established across this coil of wire. Now, the key relationship here, the constant of proportionality, is actually quite simple. And it's this constant of proportionality, which is often known as Lenz's law. It's a simple minus sign. So this thing here is often referred to as Lenz's law. That is, that the voltage that is established is established to oppose the change in the flux with time. This is the key feature of magnetic inductance. The electric potential difference that's established, for instance, in this coil of wire, is set up in such a way that the uh, voltage attempts to oppose the change in magnetic flux. So, for instance, if you set up a voltage in here, what happens? A current begins to flow. Well, as a current begins to flow, a magnetic field appears from the wire. And what Faraday and Lenz and others recognized is that the flow of current due to this electric potential difference is such that the magnetic field created by the change in current will attempt to cancel out the changes in magnetic field from the external field. So, the, to sort of summarize this, when you have magnetic induction, you get a voltage which gives you a current which establishes a B, for instance, in the wire, which tries to cancel the change in the external, okay, the external magnetic field, B of EXT. So magnetic induction operates in a way such that the voltage that's created by the induction in this coil of wire generates a current, and we know the current flowing through a wire makes a magnetic field, we can call that B wire, and the direction of B wire is such that it attempts to cancel out any changes in magnetic field. So if you're increasing magnetic field through the coil, the current flows in such a way that the magnetic field due to the wire tries to decrease the magnetic field. So it tries to negate it. If you decrease the magnetic field through the wire, if I have a really strong magnetic field here to begin with, and then I decrease it, maybe I take a bar magnet and I move it away like I did in the FET demonstrator. Okay, and again, picture the south pole of that magnet being pulled away from the coil of wire. What happened? The lamp lit. And the lamp lit because as the magnetic field decreased inside of the coil of wire, the current was established in such a way to generate a magnetic field to try to restore the magnetic field inside of the, the loop. Now this is not an infinite game. I mean, there comes a point where 
the energy available to the coil of wire to do that is no longer there, and so it runs out of steam and it can no longer oppose the changes. But this is actually a really wild thing. So if you have a loop of conductor, like a solenoid like this, and you want to figure out well, uh, according to uh, Faraday's law, if I increase the magnetic field through here, which way will the current flow? We can do a quick analysis to figure out which way the current will flow in order to oppose the change in magnetic field. All right, so let's consider a picture of a loop of wire. We're going to draw the loop of wire in the plane of the whiteboard. So here is my loop of wire. It's not hooked up to anything. It's just sitting there. And what we're going to do is we're going to expose it to changes in magnetic field penetrating the area enclosed by the loop A. Okay? So this thing has some, some radius R and thus some A equals pi R squared. We're going to change the magnetic field lines penetrating this area. We're going to change the magnetic flux. Right now there is none. There's no magnetic field present. We're going to increase it. And using Faraday's law, with the little opposition piece in it, negative d phi b dt, we're going to analyze what we would expect the loop to do, the charges in the loop to do in response to the changing magnetic fields. So let's imagine now that we start increasing magnetic field pointing into the board. So I'm bringing maybe a north end of a bar magnet closer and closer to the board. We'll start with a very weak field. So We'll just put a few magnetic field lines penetrating the area. So the bar magnet's still kind of far away at this point. So just a few magnetic field lines are penetrating the area. There were none before, and now there are magnetic field lines penetrating the area. So originally, at say time equals zero, phi b, which is b a cosine theta, equals zero. And at some later time, T equals, let's call it T sub 1. Now there's a, a little bit of magnetic field penetrating the area of the board. And so now we have some new phi B at T1, which is B1A cosine theta. It's not zero anymore. There is a non-zero B penetrating a non-zero A. And uh, well, we can figure out what direction, what, how cos theta is going to look. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the orientation of the, the area here is such that the A would be parallel to B. B points into the board A uh, can be parallel to B. And so cosine of theta is just going to be 1. Imagine some even later time where even more magnetic field penetrates the board. We've brought the bar magnet way closer now. So we have a new phi b at some time, t2, which is b2a cosine theta. Again, theta hasn't changed. We've added more b into the picture. We've kept a the same. b2 is greater than b1. So flux has increased. We have a bigger number now multiplying a cosine theta. So phi b has gone up. The flux has increased. What is the conductor doing this whole time in response to this? Well, according to Faraday's law, with the little piece of opposition in there, uh, the piece of resistance, if you will, the increase in flux will be resisted by whatever voltage is set up inside of the wire. Well, how is the wire going to resist this? Well, we have magnetic field increasing into the board. So what the wire will do is it will set up a current in such a way that it creates magnetic field out of the board resisting the increase into the board. So it will attempt to subtract off some of that magnetic field increase that is now entering the board. Well, we can use right-hand rules to figure out what direction current is going to flow as a result. Again, we're looking for the creation of a magnetic field by a current flowing in the conducting loop that sets up a magne magnetic field of its own that opposes that change. Well, let's see what happens. So we have magnetic field externally increasing into the board. The current will be set up in such a way that it will create a magnetic field that points out to try to cancel out some or all of the change. And so in order for that to happen, in order for magnetic field from the wire to point uh, out of the, the board, 
it has to be the case that the current in the loop is circulating according to the direction that my fingers are pointing. So current I would have to start flowing counterclockwise in this loop. All right, so again, let's review what I did. External magnetic field is increasing into the board. Faraday's law, which is determined by doing experiments on systems like this, tells us that the voltage set up in here will create a current that creates a magnetic field that opposes that change. The way to oppose that change is to add your own magnetic field pointing out of the board and try to cancel out the change. So to do that, you have to create a circulating current that makes a V pointing out, and your fingers indicate the direction the current must be circulating, and that's counterclockwise in the loop. All right. So if this loop has some resistance, okay, then we know from Ohm's law, and uh, let, me, let me pick a symbol for this because I've already used R for the radius of the circle. Uh, you know, this is going to be a little bit confusing, but just be aware of the fact that when I write R in Ohm's law, I'm writing resistance, not radius of the, the circle. Okay? We know from Ohm's law that there's going to be, uh, if there's any resistance in the conductor, and there's always a little resistance in conductors, then the current that's set up, if you take the product of those two things, you'll get the, the voltage that's set up in the loop to create the current in the first place. And we know that this is equal to the negative of the change in the flux with respect to time. And we can go one step further, actually. We can substitute in this equation over here. Area is not changing with time. Only the strength of B is changing with time. So if I now substitute in for phi with BA, then I finally can write that the voltage that's uh, set up in here is the negative of the area times the change in magnetic field with respect to time. Again, this is the derivative with respect to time of B times A. A is not time dependent. It's a constant with respect to time. So the derivative does not act on it. You can pull it out in front. And that leaves just B. And we know B is changing with time. At T2, the strength of B is greater than when it was at time 1. And so B is, in fact, dependent on time, and the derivative will act on it as a result. You can't escape that. So this is about the simplest you can get it without knowing the time dependence, the function that describes how B and T are related to one another. And this will be equal to E the electromotive force that's set up in the wire in response to the induced, uh, the change in magnetic flux through the, through the wire. So it's actually a nice, neat little picture. You have a change in flux. The conductor will do whatever it can to set up a current to oppose that change while the change is happening. And so you can very quickly kind of use right-hand rules in math to figure out the answers to questions. Like, for instance, what direction is the magnetic field uh, from the loop going to point? Uh, therefore, what direction will the current in the loop flow? Okay, and you can use the right-hand rule. That's the direction of B is your thumb. The direction your fingers curl is the direction current is circulating in the loop. All nice and neat. All right, so I hope this helps to kind of get you set up with this picture mathematically of flux, B, A, cosine, theta. Uh, what's changing? Is it B? Is it A? Is it theta? Is it some combination of those things? Think about that. Uh, how do I then figure out the direction of the current in the loop? And then finally, uh, how do I calculate the magnitude of the voltage that's, that is uh, set up inside the loop? So if you're only interested in the magnitude of the voltage, this sign here just tells you that that voltage opposes the, uh, the change in magnetic flux. Okay? But if you're just interested in the magnitude of the voltage, you just need to take the magnitude of, uh, of the change in flux with respect to time and so forth. Okay? All right, so let's look at this now in the case of the solenoid and actually come up with an expression for the flux, uh, magnetic flux, penetrating a solenoid. All right, so I have here a cartoon of a solenoid. And again, a solenoid is just uh, repeated turns of wire that are very closely spaced. I I've drawn this in a very cartoon fashion to show you that there are loops and curls here. But in a real solenoid, as you saw earlier in the demonstrations of magnetic inductance, those coils of copper wire, for instance, are very tightly packed together. So uh, in the cartoon here, there are uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 turns. So in this particular wire, we have 13 turns of wire, so 13 loops, as it were. 
Okay, and so that's the big N, the number of turns in the solenoid. This solenoid will have some length, L, over which those turns are recurring. And in class, uh, when I showed you what the magnetic field for a solenoid looks like, you can remember that the, the magnetic field inside of a solenoid is equal to uh, mu naught N I, where I is the current flowing through the solenoid, divided by L. So if I run a current through this solenoid, I can generate a magnetic field inside the loops of wire that is uh, equal to mu naught N I over L. Now, the reason I want to go through this is because I want to talk very briefly about something called self-inductance. Inductance is the ability for a current carrying wire to set up its own magnetic field, penetrating the area of the conductor. And according to Faraday's law, if I drive a current through this loop and it creates a magnetic field inside of the, the core of the solenoid, I am now taking a B and passing it through an A, and that's giving me a flux, a magnetic flux, phi sub B equals B vector dot A vector. And so this is a particularly interesting phenomenon. Self-inductance is when your own current, creating your own magnetic field, then creates a situation where the magnetic field can penetrate the area of the conductor like these loops, creating a changing magnetic flux. Well, if I do that, if I change magnetic flux inside of that coil of wire, I will induce a voltage, an EMF. And what does that EMF do? It opposes the change in flux that's happening in the first place. So what's the physics here? I start pumping a current through the solenoid. Maybe I'm using a battery or something like that. So I'm trying to create a magnetic field, and I'm pumping a current through the solenoid. I start to create magnetic field inside of the solenoid as I ramp up the current. So as I increase I from 0 to like 5 amps, I'm increasing B from 0 to whatever its final value will be, depending on the geometry of the solenoid. Well, that creates magnetic field inside of the area of the solenoid. And that creates flux. So what will happen is, as B solenoid increases, I will get a change in flux penetrating the area of the solenoid. So this thing has some area A. Those loops of wire have some area A. I will have a B dot A that's increasing with time, and that will create a D phi DT. And a D phi DT will create an EMF, according to Faraday's law, that will oppose the increase in flux. So what will happen? Self-inductance is when a, a turn of wire like this, a solenoid for instance, or even a single loop, you put current into it, it actually resists you putting current into it. It fights back. And it fights back because it's trying to oppose the change in flux through its own area. This is an incredible phenomenon, and it's the basis of a great deal of modern electronics. If you have a device that is very sensitive to little fluctuations in electric current, and you want to protect that device from those little fluctuations that inevitably are going to occur uh, in a circuit, you put it, a loop of wire in it. And any time the current changes, that will create um, a changing magnetic field inside the loop of wire. And that change will be opposed by the loop itself because it will create an EMF that opposes the change in flux. So what happens if I try to pump current into this and create magnetic field, the loop will try to drive a current back against me and tamp down the increase in flux. It'll try to drive it down. So this is what's known as an inductor. And a solenoid is a great example of that. Actually, even a single loop of wire is a great example of an inductor. And an inductor is capable of resisting changes in current because changes in current create changes in magnetic field. Changes in magnetic field create changes in flux through this loop. And changes in flux create voltages that oppose the change. 
So there's this sort of beautiful cycle of things that happens. Now eventually, there's only so much energy for this process to occur. If you keep your battery on this wire and this coil of wire, eventually it will set up a steady current. There will be no more change in current. Uh, there's nothing more to oppose, and so the coil just stops opposing. There's no more uh, EMF uh, due to the, uh, the self-inductance anymore. If you try to take current away from the loop, though, it will attempt to drive current back through the loop to increase it again to keep the magnetic field from changing inside of the solenoid. So this is something called inductance, and specifically self-inductance, when a loop of wire is capable of regulating the current in it by using energy in its magnetic field or storing energy in its magnetic field uh, in order to oppose or promote change in flux, so to keep current steady. It always wants an inductor, wants to keep current steady. If it starts zero, it wants to keep it at zero. Uh, if it starts at a non-zero level and it's constant and then it decreases or increases, the inductor will resist that change. And so these become like little magnetic resistors and they will set up little EMFs to try to oppose changes in circuit. And again, it's great for electronics that you need to protect from small changes in current that could do damage to sensitive instrumentation, medical instrumentation or uh, technical instrumentation for engineering or research purposes. So what's observed when you have loops of wire like this in a circuit. For instance, if I were to take a battery and plug it into a loop of wire, okay, just like that solenoid up there. So this is actually the symbol for an inductor in a circuit. It's not an accident that it looks like a little solenoid. And uh, there's a relationship, much like Ohm's law, okay, right? There's Ohm's law for resistors, Ohm's law, for resistors, what do you have in Ohm's law? You have a relationship between current and voltage. The amount of voltage I put on a resistor gives me a certain amount of current. If I double the voltage, I double the current. And so an ohmic material is one where there is this linear relationship between the voltage I place on the material and the current that results in the material. That constant of proportionality is what we know is the resistance, R. There's a similar law for inductors, specifically self-inductors. That is, loops of wire that you can put into a circuit when you try to drive current through them. If you try to increase the current, they will create a voltage that opposes that increase. If you try to decrease the current, they'll create a voltage that tries to put current back in where it's suddenly decreasing away. And the law for inductors is very simple. It essentially states that, look, there's a relationship between the flux through that loop of wire, through the solenoid, and the current that I drive through that solenoid. So if I drive more I, I increase the flux. If I drive less I, I decrease the flux. And the relationship is written as this equation. Phi is equal to some constant of proportionality L, times the current. And this quantity here is known as inductance. It gives you the relationship between the current you drive through a solenoid, any inductor, and the amount of magnetic flux that's set up inside the loops of wire in the inductor. Now, it depends on the device that you've constructed as to what exactly L is. Uh, but the good news is, is that for a solenoid, we can actually write down an equation for this inductance fairly easily. So let's go ahead and do that. We're interested in calculating the flux that's established by running a current through a solenoid. And to do this, we need to know the following things. We need to know B vector, and we need to know A vector. We know the magnitude of B and A. The magnitude of B is just equal to mu naught and I, where N is the number density of turns. It's the number of turns of wire per unit length. I is the current that you drive through that, that coil of wire. And of course, mu naught is our constant, the permeability of free space. Well, I know the magnitude of A as well. Okay, so the magnitude of A I'm just going to write that as, I'm going to be cheap and, and uh, just write it as A. All right, you could figure out what the radius of the turns are and plug that in, but it's just some area A. It could be circular or something else, but it's just an area, something in meters squared. 
What we need to figure out, however, is the total area penetrated by the magnetic field. We, we know from looking at the solenoid that when you run a current through a solenoid, it sets up a nice uniform magnetic field all the way along the axis of the solenoid, penetrating each and every one of the areas involved in the you know, many turns of wire in the solenoid. So the A here is the total area penetrated by all that magnetic field. And the total area is just the number of loops of wire, N, times the area of a single loop. So, you know, if I have a, a little, uh, you know, one centimeter radius uh, turn of wire, then I know that the area of that turn of wire is pi times one centimeter squared. You can convert that to meters if you like. And then I have many of those stacked up one after the other to make the solenoid. All these many loops of wire stacked up in a cylinder to make the solenoid. And just like the one, again, that I showed you in the, in the lecture demonstration. So the total area penetrated by magnetic field is the number of loops times the area of each loop. That's the total number of meters squared that that magnetic field is going to penetrate as it goes down the long axis of the solenoid. All right, well, I'm nearly there. Uh, we can rewrite this in a convenient way. We could rewrite this as the number density times the length times the area of a single loop. So if number density is n over l, then I can write big N in terms of little n by multiplying both sides by L. So I just rewrote big N as little n L, and then I still have the area of each loop. Well, this finally lets me get an equation. So now I know that the, the flux, phi B, is BA. What's the cosine of theta here? Well, we have the uh, magnetic field penetrating perpendicular to the plane of each loop. So B and A. Uh, the A vector is parallel to the B vector. So the cosine of the angle between them is just 1. The angle between them is 0. So this is just BA. And it's the magnetic field of the solenoid, mu naught Ni, times NL times the area of the loop. All right? So just to keep things straight here, this L right now is the length of the solenoid. All right, so not to be confused with the inductance, which we're going to try to figure out in a second here. Okay, well, we're nearly there. So we want to find a relationship between phi b and i. And whatever the thing is that multiplies i to give you phi b, that's the self-inductance, the, just the inductance of this particular circuit. So we can go over here and we can pick this equation up. We have phi b, and that's equal to mu naught, which is just a constant. We have two n's multiplied by one another, so we have n squared. We have the length of the solenoid, L. And we have the area of each loop of the solenoid, whatever that is. And then finally, we have the current. So this here, for a solenoid, this is the inductance. So I took the liberty of rewriting the inductance of a solenoid, the self-inductance L of a solenoid, as uh, just down here as mu naught n squared. I've changed my notation for the length, so it's a little bit less confusing. So I've used a little cursive L now for the length of the solenoid, length of the solenoid, and then the area of each loop. Uh, now, the units of this are a little funky. Uh, the units of mu naught are tesla meters per amp. The units of the number density squared are just number of turns, so just number one per meter squared. Length is meters, area is meters squared. And so you wind up with the funny units of this inductance, uh, tesla meters squared per amp. Well, this gets its own name uh, in honor of one of the physicists that discovered inductance in the first place. And the unit of this is the Henry, which is just written as an H. Uh, and actually, if you kind of go and, and uh, work back through this, what you find out is that mu naught, which is 4 pi times 10 to the 7th, you can actually rewrite mu naught in terms of the unit, the Henry, as just Henry's per meter, which is actually kind of nice. That's a lot easier than Tesla meter per amp. So this is a lot easier to, uh, to remember. You see here, if you just take 
Henrys and divide by meters, one of the meters goes away here and you just get back to the units of mu naught again. So anyway, that's just a little bit of an aside, but inductance is kind of nice because once you define the quantity, you can actually greatly simplify your, your units for all of this stuff. But uh, it's enough to remember that when you're given inductance, you will be given the strength of an inductor, regardless of whether it's a solenoid or not, in henrys. So if you see, you know, this is an inductor with a, with a strength of five millihenrys, uh, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about this unit of inductance, which again, just to remind you, is the constant of proportionality between the current you drive through an inductor and the magnetic flux that penetrates the inside of the inductor in the first place. Now the last concept that I want to talk about here regarding magnetic fields, and uh, you know, this is it, this is the end of the road on magnetic fields, is energy. In particular, energy stored in magnetic fields. So for instance, if I imagine that I have a circuit like this, and I have an inductor hooked up to the circuit. Okay, so I have a battery, and the battery has some EMF E that it generates, and I have an inductor with some inductance L, five millihenries or something like that. Uh, I can now start thinking about Kirchhoff's rules, taking little loops that go through this system and then analyze what's going on in terms of energy and energy conservation and power and other concepts like that. All right, so this isn't as scary as it sounds. Uh, what we're gonna do is there's only a single loop in this circuit, and we know that if we walk any path in the circuit, that we will, uh, if we take a closed path, the net change in electric potential through that closed path in any moment in time is going to be zero. So let's just start our walk down here at point A. And again, for the sake of this, let's imagine that there is a current I at a moment in time, T, all right, so at some moment in time, T, at that moment in time, there's a current in the circuit that's being driven by the battery. Now remember, at the next moment in time, the battery might be trying to drive more current through the inductor. But because of self-inductance, that inductor is attempting to push back against the change in current. It's trying to push back against the change in magnetic flux inside of its coils. So we can analyze the circuit now just using Kirchhoff's loop law. So we'll start from point A, and we'll take a clockwise walk around. And we know that the net change has to be equal to zero in all of the, the, the potentials uh, that we go through. Well, we go through the battery from the negative side to the positive side. So if we take our loop, we know that the sum of the Vs in the loop will be equal to zero. The first voltage that we encounter is the battery voltage. And we'll call that just E. And then we travel through this conductor, no resistance, no resistance, and then we hit the inductor. And we know from Faraday's law that the inductor sets up an opposing voltage to the battery to attempt to resist changes in current and flux through the inductor. So we know that this is going to be, we know the form of this, okay? But we know that whatever this voltage is, the sum of it plus the battery voltage is going to be equal to zero. Because after the inductor, we come back to point A. We've come full circle. We've encountered no other devices in the circuit. And in a closed circuit, this has to be true. Energy has to be conserved. Well, we can look at this in a little bit more detail. So for instance, we can look at uh, the actual thing that we put in here from Faraday's law. We know that this is the change in the magnetic flux with time. Well, and from the relationship involving inductance, current, and flux, we know that the flux is proportional to the current that's put through the inductor and that constant of proportionality is the inductance in Henry's L, right there. So we can rewrite this equation one more time as L, which is just a constant, di dt. Now don't be frightened. In principle, this right here is a time-dependent equation involving the first derivative of the current with respect to time, 
This is a differential equation, and much like with RC circuits, one would have to solve this equation not for a number, but for a function that represents how the current changes with time. So the, that depends on the details of the, of the problem. If, we're, if we have a switch in the circuit, we close it, we start to drive current through this. At first, the inductor will completely oppose changes in current, and it won't let any current get set up in it. But as the battery continues to push on it, it will, a little current will flow, and then more current will flow, and eventually it will plateau out at its maximum value, and it will level off. There will be no more changes in current. And, uh, and in that case, we would have a situation where the current is steady, and there's no more change in current, so there's no more change in flux, so there's no more opposition from the inductor, and it just sits there storing energy in its magnetic field. So we're dri as we drive a current through this, and it reaches its flat, steady maximum value, of course, this thing is going to be uh, a source of magnetic field as we continue to drive current through it. This is current going through a loop. This is going to set up a magnetic field, and that magnetic field is storing energy for us. If we then try to remove the current, energy will be drained from the magnetic field to put current back, opposing the change in the circuit. Uh, but that won't last forever. Eventually, you'll run out of stored magnetic field, and the inductor will no longer be able to keep the current going. If you disconnect the battery from this, for instance, and then short the inductor across itself, it will drive a current at first, but that current will then decrease to zero as it runs out of magnetic field stored, and then we run out of current and it stops. So it's a little bit like a capacitor, but rather than using an electric field to store energy, an inductor uses magnetic field to store energy. So the inductor is the magnetic analog to the capacitor in electric field applications. It's the magnetic field application for storing energy. And what we're really interested in is we're really interested in understanding exactly how it is that uh, energy is stored in the magnetic field. We want to know, given a certain current, given an inductance, how much energy is being stored in that inductor. And we can figure it out from this equation. Here's how you do it. We know, in general, that power is current times voltage. So if I multiply that equation by current, I, I can actually turn it into an equation about power. Power driven by the battery and power dissipated by the inductor. So let me go ahead and do that. If I multiply this equation through, totally legit thing to do. Nothing has changed here, except that now I have I E on this side, so this is now the power supplied by the battery. And over here I have uh, negative Li di dt. This too has units of power, energy per unit time. And this is the power dissipated. by the inductor. Well, great. We actually have basically what we're looking for now. I wanted to know energy stuff about the inductor. And now I know the power that's being dissipated by the inductor. I know the energy per unit time that's being put into the magnetic field, taken out of the circuit, put into the magnetic field uh, by that device. And that's what I wanted. So let's go ahead and write that down. The power dissipated by the inductor is Li di dt. Well, let's think about the core definition of power. Power is equal to the change in potential energy, change in energy of any kind, with respect to time. And if I think about infinitesimal changes in energy and infinitesimal changes in time, this can just be written as a derivative. OK, well, I'm almost there. So I know that in my inductor that the power dissipated by the inductor is equal to the change in the energy stored in the inductor with respect to time. And I have the equation for that. It's Li di dt. So all I have to do to get energy is take the integral of both sides of this equation with respect to time. What does the integral do? Remember what the integral does. The integral undoes the derivative. So if I calculate the indefinite integral of du dt with respect to dt, 
that just gives me back u. It undoes the derivative. The integral is the antiderivative. So if I want to get u, I just have to calculate the integral of this thing with respect to time. All right, well, that's just going to be the integral of li di dt with respect to t. The dt's cancel over here in this integral, and I'm left with the indefinite integral of li di. Well, this is just the integral of x dx, right? It's just a different variable. So the integral of x dx is easy. It's 1 half x squared. The integral of i di is 1 half i squared. And we're done. 1 half l i squared. This is the energy stored in the inductor in its magnetic field at a given moment in time when the current has some value i. So if I know the inductance l, 5 millihenries, and I know the current, 1 amp, I can calculate the total amount of energy that's stored in the inductor at that time. All right, so 1 half of 5 is 2.5. 1 amp squared is 1, so I have 2.5 joules of energy stored in the inductor at that moment in time when the current is 1 amp. You can store a lot of energy in a magnetic field, uh, depending on how you design your inductors and how big you get your inductance by uh, playing around with the parameters of a solenoid, for instance. You can store a tremendous amount of energy inside of a solenoidal magnetic field, inside of an inductor. So imagine, for instance, what it would be like to suddenly have the really high magnetic field, very high current superconducting magnets of an MRI machine dump all the energy that's present in their magnetic field uh, someplace, like back into the circuits that power the MRI machine in the first place. It's a disaster. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, the experiment that I work on, experienced a tremendous accident uh, before it switched on in 2010, finally. Uh, that accident was a one-year setback for the experiment. And what happened was the superconducting wire inside of the very high magnetic field magnets failed because the cooling failed. When the cooling failed, superconducting goes normal conducting. And when you go normal conducting, you're suddenly taking a whole bunch of I and dumping it through a big resistor. And so what happened was all the energy in the magnetic field was dumped back into the circuit to oppose the change in magnetic field. And, uh, well, it was a tremendous explosion. It actually knocked out a huge section of the Large Hadron Collider completely out of commission. And it took a year to uh, bring that section down, go in and investigate, and then replace the broken parts, and then figure out if there were any more sections of the Large Hadron Collider that might fail in the same way. Uh, so this might not seem like a very impressive equation, but if you're putting a patient in a big magnetic field, you really want to be sure that your MRI machine is functioning absolutely perfectly. This is why it's essential to have good technical personnel that really understand the equipment, really understand the machines, be they an engineer or a physicist who can work with the physicians and make sure the equipment is functioning normally and perfectly for the safety of the patients. You never want to take a big inductor like an MRI solenoid and ever have it dump all of its power from its magnetic field like back into the device itself. You can cause a massive explosion uh, when that happens. Having discussed energy and the energy that can be stored in an inductor, it's now important to go back and think about what it means to run a current through an inductor, have that inductor generate its own magnetic field, which then penetrates the area of the inductor, causing flux, and then a voltage that opposes the change in flux. This isn't magic. This is conservation of energy. The energy has to come from somewhere to cause the magnetic field to be set up that then opposes the change in magnetic flux through the inductor. In the case of a circuit, the energy comes from the battery. The battery provides a constant electric potential difference. It's a source of energy that can drive charge in a current through the circuit. And so you're es essentially converting energy from the battery into energy stored in the magnetic field. If you want to release the energy stored in the magnetic field, all you have to do is decrease the current that's being driven through the inductor. So you could do this, for instance, by uh, suddenly removing the battery and just connecting the inductor across itself. Now, there's no more battery, so there shouldn't be any more current drawn by the circuit. But what happens is that the energy stored in that magnetic field is released. This creates an electric potential difference that attempts to drive current in the direction it was originally flowing in the inductor. And eventually you run out of magnetic field, you run out of energy, and no more current flows. So there's nothing magic here. Energy is being stored in the magnetic field in an inductor. 
And then when the current attempts to increase or decrease, energy is released from the magnetic field uh, and put back into current or into a voltage that resists changes in current. You can imagine that if you had a source of mechanical energy, you could convert that mechanical energy into energy stored in the magnetic field. So for example, if you were to take a permanent magnet and drop it inside of the area of a conductor, this would cause a changing flux, that changing flux would cause an electric potential that would drive a current, and that current is going to be driven through the conductor. Ohm's law says that that's going to cause power to be dissipated in the conductor. So we, we can imagine if we're attempting to push or drop a magnet through a conductor, as currents are set up in the conductor in response to the changing magnetic flux, this will cause the dissipation of mechanical energy. We can do demonstrations of this. Um, we, for instance, might swing a conductor through a magnetic field. Think of a pendulum swinging in a magnetic field. If you uh, have the, the pendulum made from conductor enter the magnetic field and then try to leave it, that's going to cause a changing flux inside the conductor. That's going to cause currents to flow and that's going to cause energy to be dissipated. The energy of motion, the dropping of a magnet through a conductor, the swinging of a conductor-based pendulum through a magnetic field, that's mechanical energy, and it will be wasted in driving current through the conductor, and that will draw energy, mechanical energy, away from the system and possibly even slow it down and stop it. And we can do a couple of demonstrations that illustrate this point beautifully. Now for the next demonstration of magnetic induction, I'm going to drop some objects. I'm going to choose those objects carefully. The first thing I'm going to do, just to demonstrate that the objects really are the same, is merely drop them in front of you, and you can watch them land on the carpet at the same time. So the objects that I'm going to drop are uh, a magnet, and you can figure out which one of these is magnetic by trying to put it up against the blackboard, which is a surface that would let a magnet stick to it if, it were, if this was actually magnetic. We see that this is not magnetic, it just falls right off. But this other uh, thing here, and I'll show these to the camera in a moment, that's a magnet. It sticks very nicely to the blackboard. It's actually quite a strong magnet too. Let me just hold these up to the board, to the camera for a second. You can see that in all respects, these things look basically identical. I, it's hard to demonstrate this here, but they have the same uh, mass too. There's, there's really no weight difference at all in Earth's gravity between these two uh, objects here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a drop test just to demonstrate that there's no funny business here. Uh, we know that Newton's law that uh, two objects in the same gravitational field even with, uh, with different masses will maintain the same acceleration. And uh, we can demonstrate that just by doing a simple drop test, right? You've seen these before where you drop the objects and they, they, you drop them from the same height and then they hit the ground at the same time. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so just to demonstrate that there's no funny business here, let me go ahead and do a drop test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to release these two objects, one magnetic, one non-magnetic, from the same height. And you can see that they hit the surface at the same time, the clicks on the surface of the table were at the same time. Go ahead, rewind it, play forward again, and you'll, you'll see that they hit it exactly at the same moment on the table, and the clicks are simultaneous between them. Okay, so keep that in mind, that these objects dropped in a gravitational field, they respond the same way to gravity, even though one is magnetic, one is not. That has nothing to do with whether they fall at the same rate in a gravitational field. But if we were to now put these inside of a conductor, where one of these being a magnet can induce currents in the conductor, and the other one being non-magnetic can't, Okay, in the same way that the bar magnet was able to induce a voltage and thus a current in the conductive uh, solenoidal coil I showed you a, a bit ago, uh, we're going to now examine what happens if I drop test this, not in the air, but through, uh, first of all, a, uh, an insulating material and then a conducting material. So I'm going to take the magnet. You can see this is the magnet because it sticks to a piece of metal. And I'm going to drop it through this insulating cardboard tube. You see it dropped very fast, came right out the bottom. Let's take the non-magnet. You can tell this is the non-magnet because it doesn't stick to the metal. And I'm going to drop it through the insulating cardboard tube. No conductors present in the cardboard tube. That also fell very fast, pretty much at the same rate as the magnet. Now what if I replace the cardboard tube 
with a copper tube, a conductor tube. Now here's the non-magnet. You see it's the non-magnet, doesn't stick to this little piece of metal at all. No funny business. And I'm going to drop it in the copper tube. It doesn't stick to the copper tube at all either. You see, no attraction. And I drop it. It drops very fast, comes right out the bottom of the tube. Now what if I take the magnet? You see this is the magnet because it sticks to this little piece of uh, metal here that I have. Boom. Self-sustaining. You see it's not attracted to the copper at all. It doesn't stick to the copper at all. But what happens when I drop it in the copper tube? We see that the magnet is slowed through the copper tube as it drops. Not because it's in contact with the copper tube, but because it's creating currents in the copper tube as it goes through magnetic induction, and this dissipates energy, and it takes a long time for it to fall. Now I can do this experiment again, this time taking an insulator like glass and turning it into the base of a pendulum. So I just clip it to the bottom of the pendulum. The glass is going to swing between the north and south pole of this very strong magnet that you see here. And if I just let it go, you see it swings freely in between the, uh, the poles of the magnet. No physical contact. Now if I draw the glass back and I let it go, we can just sort of sit here and count how many seconds it takes for this pendulum to swing down. So swinging, swinging, swinging. Just a nice piece of glass swinging between north and south poles. Glass charges are not free to move. Is there any magnetic induction? Well, we don't expect it. And this thing does seem to be just swinging freely. So I'll just stop it. And I'm going to take the glass out. And I'm going to replace the glass, which is an insulator, with a conductor. I have here a little circle of aluminum. You see it's a solid circle, a little uh, plate of aluminum. And I can go ahead and clip that right into the pendulum holder. And again, I want to demonstrate that this is free to swing between the north and south poles of the magnet. See? There's no resistance in there whatsoever. And then I let it go. Not even one swing. The mechanical energy of the falling pendulum is dissipated entirely by currents that are set up as the area moves through the magnetic field. That causes a changing flux, which causes a voltage, which causes currents that dissipate energy. Now what if I could interrupt the flow of current in this disk? What if instead of a solid metal disk, I used one that's got all these holes cut in it, these little slots? See how this is slotted? The aluminum's been interrupted by gaps of air. So now there isn't a clear path for current to circulate inside of the area. What will happen? Well, if I swing the pendulum back, you see it's still free to swing. If I pull it back and then let it go, look at that. It's almost swinging freely. You see it wears down pretty quickly compared to the glass, but it gets a, at least a, several swings in before it stops. And this is the principle by which you can detect, for instance, cracks in the skin of an airline uh, uh, fuselage. By, by moving a magnetic field over the skin, you can detect you know, voltages and currents, and you can look to see if there are interruptions in the uh, current flow in the surface that would then be indicative of a crack uh, in the surface of the metal skin of the plane. So this is a very common technique, for instance, for looking for flaws in the skin of metal aircraft. A really neat demonstration of the beautiful things that you can do with magnetic induction is illustrated by this little simulator. In the world around us, we take for granted the fact that we use electricity to do things. We use the movement of electrons in electric current to light our lights, power our laptops, charge our phones, uh, heck, even power our cars uh, in some cases these days. But where does that electricity come from? Well, it comes from magnetic induction. As Faraday recognized, if I can change the density of magnetic field lines penetrating an area enclosed by a conducting loop of some sort, any change in that quantity, any change in that flux, will result in electricity flowing in the conductor. And if I can find a way to sustain that change of magnetic flux,
well, then I should be able to drive an electric current through a conductor and then hook things up to that and do work and power devices and so forth, the very thing we do in the modern world. Well, this little demonstrator illustrates the principle. I have here a mechanical source of energy. This is a spigot. When I flip the switch on, a flow of water will come out of the end of the spigot. I have a paddle wheel. Now, you've probably seen these uh, decorating yards or parks or maybe even doing serious work near a uh, hydroelectric power plant of some sort. Uh, usually they're much fancier and they're called turbines in that case. But the principle's the same. When the paddle wheels are struck uh, by the flow of water, the wheel will spin. And now affixed to the paddle wheel is a magnet. And so you can now imagine what was going to happen if I turn on the water, okay, so I could you know, imagine harnessing a river to do this. Uh, turn on the flow of water, hook a turbine or a paddle wheel up to that flow, attach some magnets to the turbine, and then have those magnets move in the presence of a loop of wire. I should be able to, according to the principle of magnetic induction, uh, I should be able to induce a voltage and thus a current in this conductor and light a light bulb. And in fact, what we're going to see is this is the exact basis of something called alternating current. Watch very carefully the, uh, uh, the ions inside the wire as they move. They'll move back and forth, but every time they move, they do work on the light bulb and the light bulb lights. And uh, if you control this process carefully enough, yes, the light bulb is flickering, but you can make it flicker so fast that human eyes can't see it. So let me switch on the flow of water here. And look at that. So you see we have our paddle wheel now spinning at 100 revolutions per minute. Uh, fixed to that is a bar magnet spinning at 100 revolutions per minute. We can imagine in our minds, uh, actually we don't have to, we can show the magnetic field as it's uh, being changed in the presence of this uh, conducting loop of wire. And uh, there we have it. We have a changing magnetic field through a fixed area. B vector dot A vector is changing with time. And whenever that happens, you set up a voltage and inside of a resistive device, you can establish a current that can do work and in this case, light a light bulb. So this is the principle of electric power generation. This is in fact a generator. You can take one source of energy, in this case, mechanical energy from the pressing of water on paddle wheels. You could burn fuel and uh, make a piston move using expanding gases and do the same thing. But the idea is always the same. You take one form of energy, you turn it into motion of a magnet. The motion of the magnet induces a current, and that current can then be used to power devices like lamps, computers, refrigerators, and so forth. These things are great in an emergency for powering home appliances uh, that you really need, things you need to boil water, for instance. They're also simply useful for generating all of the power that's needed by our electrical devices throughout the entire electrical grid.